Hey everybody, I'm PJ. Um, here to do a talk called Urban Legends, what, what you code makes you who you are. So this is interesting, bear with me for a few minutes. Uh, first of all, that doesn't work, because you gotta turn it on. So I work at Logs.io, we have a nice booth out there, we do Elk Stack as a service. We're very cost effective in comparison to a lot of our competitors. It's really cool and if you're doing Elk Stack and you hate it, or you're doing Elk Stack and you love it but you don't want to do it every day, come see us and we'll talk to you. Really cool stuff, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Let's talk about me, because that's first and foremost the most important thing. So I'm PJ, as I said, I'm a dev advocate, so I get to travel the world and speak at lots of conferences and stuff. But beyond that, I'm also a husband, a dad, um, a hockey coach. I play drums in a band. I've been playing drums since I was six years old, and I'm a lot older than six. We'll just leave it at that. Um, occasionally, I let my kids keynote big programming conferences because they're better speakers than I am. Um, but that's, that's what I do. I'm not just a programmer. I'm not just a dev advocate. I'm someone who has a lot of aspects to my life. Um, on top of that, I also run a thing called Prompt. So if you're running a meetup or a conference and you'd like to have someone come and speak about mental health and tech, I can help you with that. We provide the funds to get them there. You give them the stage to talk about. It's a very important subject and we need to talk about it more. So if you have any questions about that, please come see me after the talk. So what is this talk about? So there's a lot of common misconceptions about programming languages. You know, something's better than something else. And other things are obviously just so outdated we should never use them ever again. There's also ideas that parts of the tech community are better than other parts of that community or have rules that don't make sense. There's also this idea that, you know, open source is so much better than the enterprise or enterprise is so much better than the open source for reasons. So we're going to try to work on these legends and see if we can do away with some of the myths. If you saw the talk title, what this talk is not about is actual urban legends. So if you came here looking to learn about the Loch Ness Monster or the Chupacabra, that's not gonna happen and I apologize. I'll give you a moment to walk out. Cool, I just broke my clicker again. So let's start with Ruby. How many of you do Ruby or have done Ruby? Ruby's like my people, I love Ruby. I was a, a Microsoft developer for years and then uh, discovered Ruby because I had to. Um, and of course I was asked, can you learn Ruby in a weekend? And I said, no, I have a family. Um, that's not realistic, but I did learn Ruby and I'm so glad that I did, it's so much fun. Ruby's great. You know, it's designed for programmer happiness, right? But it gets this, this thing, this stigmatism. And why? Because Rails. Um, if you're not a programmer or you work with someone who's not a programmer, like say your boss, um, they often think that because you're using Rails and the big, the big catchphrase is Rails is magic, you can get 90% of the work done in 10% of the time, they think you just everything's really easy. The other side of Rails is it has a very vocal um, person who created it, who has lots of opinions about lots of stuff. And one-on-one, -on -one, he's a great person on Twitter, not so much. But it kind of gets this attitude that, oh, all Rubyists are just like DHH. They're opinionated, they're hipsters, they don't care. But the thing is, Ruby is not Rails. That's myth number one. You can do a lot of Ruby without ever using Rails. I've developed a bunch of applications that have nothing to do with Rails. There's so many other frameworks out there. You can get Ruby to the web without ever using Rails. You can use Hanami or Sinatra or anything. There's lots of different options. So let's do away with the idea that the Rails community is the Ruby community. It's just a part of the Ruby community. The other idea is that Ruby is not useful. I want you to take this in for a second, read this comic. This is a, a personal favorite of mine. So the assumption here is that the slightly chubby guy wearing the Ruby t-shirt, wearing a hat, has a beard, making useless apps that no one's ever gonna use. This is the average Rubyist. Now, I am slightly chubby, I am wearing a hat, and I do have a beard, but that's not me, and not representative of all Rubyists by any stretch of the imagination. Now granted, yeah, people do make useless apps in any language, not just Ruby, but this whole, you know, I built an espresso, something that finds single source espresso in Soma because everyone, of course, who uses Ruby works at a startup in San Francisco that makes equally useful products. And the other guy's like, cool, I, I've made the, the app that keeps this plane in the air. Good for you, hopefully it's not United. Um, <laughs> had, to, had to slip that in there. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, this is kind of the concept. You know, I even saw this, as I was getting ready for this talk, as I was coming here, this is a tweet that came out like the night before I got to, to Denver. And I was like, come on. And names have been redacted to protect the innocents, but I was like, seriously, it's 2017. Be realistic. 
Ruby is strong. There are large scale, large scale companies using Ruby. At Logs.io we use Ruby. Zendesk uses Ruby. How many of you use Zendesk? It's a pretty common ticketing system. Um, Hulu, Blue Box, you know, Twitter still on the back end uses Ruby. These are huge companies. So to say that Ruby is for hobbyists or Ruby is for hipsters is just unrealistic. Um, so let's talk about Ruby's mortal enemy, of course, is PHP. How many of you have been or are PHP developers? Don't be embarrassed, put your hands up. Um, so the, first of all, let's do away with that myth, that Rubyists and PHP people don't get, to, don't get along. There's some kind of cross and And yes, maybe at one point in the beginning there, there was because whatever, politics and reasons. But PHP is an amazing language. I mean, a lot of hands went up when I said, who's done PHP? Because PHP does a lot. It powers like 80% of the internet. So when people come up and say, PHP is dead, man, that thing is, it's gone. 80% of the servers on the internet are running PHP in some way, shape, or form. Even within Rails, there is a PHP uh, tie-in so that you can port PHP code to Rails and use it effectively. So if it's dead, I'm pretty sure 80% of the internet wouldn't be using it. Uh, what are some other myths about PHP? There's no objects in PHP. And if the last time you used PHP was like PHP 4.3, you're probably right. It wasn't. It was just basically jazzed up home pages. It stood for personal home pages when it first started out, so that's realistic. Um, if you've used it since then, you know, 5.0 to 7, we won't talk about PHP 6 because that's a whole other issue that I don't have time for. Um, it's all object oriented. They're focused on the object. Is it functional programming? No, but that's, again, a whole other talk. Uh, so it is object oriented. It's not realistic to say it's not. PHP is slow. Um, this is a perspective issue. I mentioned Ruby before. Everybody says Ruby is slow. PHP is slow. These things are slow. And as developers, our concept of slow is totally skewed. We're like, wow, that took 0 .004 milliseconds. That's taking way too long. Someone's looking at your web application, chances are they don't even notice that it was 0 .004 milliseconds. They just know that this page came up. When we're talking about users using an application, that's when we worry about slow, and that number is four seconds. And if your code is running at four seconds, you have deeper, deeper problems than the particular language you're using to develop. So slowness is, is an entire, entire myth. What else? PHP is, is not secure. This is another issue. I know there's a lot of SecOps folks in, the, folks in the crowd, and I think they all understand that if you're not developing with an eye towards security, you've already screwed up. Who cares what language you're using? You need to have a secure application when you're developing it, regardless of the language you're using. So PHP is just as secure as Ruby or Java or Python or anything else. So let's put that myth to bed. Security is on the person building the application. It's not on the language they're using. Java, who doesn't love Java? Java also considered, you, <laughs> okay, maybe I shouldn't have raised my hand. <laughs> my bad. Java is, is, is another ubiquitous language. I mean, people, yeah, hands went up because Java is also a very cantankerous to code language. It's difficult. It is not easy. But at the same time, it does do amazingly powerful things. How many times do you see this thing pop up because you downloaded you know, a DocuSign and your Java's not up to date in order to sign the thing so you can get the new job or fill out your, your healthcare benefits or anything like that. If Java wasn't working properly, it wouldn't be working for you. Java has to be built and it's a huge, huge thing. And, and grand, it doesn't have a big loud community like Ruby or PHP, but it's still out there. People are still proud to be making great apps. At Logs.io, we actually use a lot of Java on the back end. Python, when Python came out, it was very much an academic scientific language, you know, pi math and pi sci and, and all these different pieces and you'd never use it to build a web application or do anything, you know, fun, like building single serve espresso apps for anything south of market in San Francisco. Why would you use Python for that? It's a scientific language. It's built for analytics. That's what Python's all about. But Python can be a lot of fun. Um, I'm gonna tell two stories here. This was the keynote last year from RailsConf um, which was one of the entire like six talks that I went to at RailsConf because you, you just go to RailsConf to hang out and talk to people. Um, but this was a presentation by one of the gentlemen from Spotify and he was demonstrating some of the cool things that they're building at Spotify using Python. And one of them, this was my favorite thing, was called um, Boiling Frogs. And the way it works is, is you name one artist and another artist and it will find 10 things in between them to, to link them up. So he used, uh, I believe it was 
Who is that girl who sang the Call Me Maybe song? Carly Rae Jepsen. Carly Rae Jepsen to Amon and Marth, which is a, a Viking death metal band from Sweden. And I was like, there's just no way. I don't care how good your algorithm is. You can't bring this together. And he did in 10 songs. Absolutely amazing. I suggest you go watch the talk. It's, it's really cool. Another thing that, uh, that I did at one point in time, I used to work for a pass. And we were very big in supporting the open source community. And there used to be this really cool thing called Git Tip. And yes, there was controversy at Git Tip. I'm not going to get into that. That's not, that's not my talk. Um, but we wanted to give back. So what we did was we wrote some Python scripts that would list a bunch of people that we wanted to give money to on a weekly basis. And we put the money and it took it from our bank account and into Git Tip so they could get some recognition for what they were doing, which is really cool. And that's not academic, that's not scientific, that's just love. That's just having fun with the scripts you can write and the, the applications you can build. So obviously you can do a lot more with Python than just scientific boring stuff. Linux, not a programming language. But, hear me out here. This, I mean, this is 2017, this is the year of the Linux de desktop, right? I have the year correct? Okay, I wanted to make sure. Um, I may have given this talk before in different years and made the same joke. Um, but Linux is, is one of those things where people are like, ah, N Linux will never be mainstream. It's for neckbeards in their basement, building scripts, you know, living with their parents, hoping for enough money to pay for their cat food and cat litter. You know, it'll never be a mainstream thing. That is one of the most preposterous things I've ever heard. And I've, I've literally had people say, it's for neckbeards. Don't, don't bother with Linux. Focus on, you know, Mac OS or, or, or that other thing with the Windows. Um, don't worry about Linux. It's never going to happen. But how many people have taken a flight where there's movies involved. And then the movie thing went down. And then you see this penguin guy, because almost every major airline is running Linux, at least for their entertainment section and for the please buckle your seatbelt, because if you don't know how to do that by now, I don't know why they need a video for that. So Linux, still a major player in every market. Perl, Perl is awesome. How many people have done Perl? Yeah, wow, that's a lot of hands. Um, so I, I added this slide because a little while ago, I, I did a blog post called Ruby is Dead because I had gone to, I don't know, 20 Ruby conferences in one year, and almost everyone had a panel or a talk or an open discussion about Ruby is dead, long live Ruby, blah, blah, blah. So I, I did this, and for some reason, Aristotle picked it up and was like, well, is Perl dead, or is it just more dead than Ruby? And it's like, no, Perl's not dead. They just came out with a new version, and it's amazing. I haven't done anything major with it, just played around with it, but compared to Perl, you know, even five years ago, it's light years ahead. And yes, it took a long time to develop, and, and, but Larry gave us gifts. He said, I want to do this right, and he did. So far from being dead, Perl is still a major player. Swift, Swift is the future. I'm done, thank you, have a good night. When Swift came out, it was of course the newest, bestest thing that was gonna allow you to build mobile apps, um, with the small caveat that it wasn't open source and you had to pay for it. Um, and people had this attitude that this was the end-all, be-all. We could solve all application problems with Swift. Um, and then I saw this tweet, and, and it's a bit dated, but I loved this tweet because it, it opened up so many questions in my mind. Objective-C developers are now obsolete. Please treat them with respect. So, okay, we're going to put that statement aside for a second. We're going to ignore those brackets and focus on the other things that are apparently obsolete. Old people are obsolete. What? I'm pretty sure that's most of our goals is to get to the point where we have to ride the bus with a cane because that means we've succeeded in life to live that long. But this is my favorite part. Pregnant women are obsolete. What? Like, this is the best you could come up with? Is a pregnant woman? I'm, 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 I'm not a biologist, but I'm relatively sure that for the success of the species, the human species, we're going to need more pregnant women. Um, until the science catches up and cloning and all that jazz, they're not obsolete. And, you know, to my mom, wasn't obsolete when she was either. Um, luckily, Swift did open source stuff. They got a little, they calmed down a bit. They opened things up. They made it a little better. So it's, it's now a viable option and not complete, utter bullshit. Um, anything with a JS. How many people have coded anything with a JS? Every hand should go up if you've ever coded anything ever. Um, and this is great. A couple years ago, there was this, like, this burst of JSs. You know, we got things like Doge.js, which is super useful. I'm sure you all know what that's used for. Kraken.js, you know, all of these kind of things that were just like, okay, 
And, and I don't mean to, to, to make fun of the JavaScript community. There's, Node is fantastic. It's amazing. There's so many things you can do with it. And, you know, Angular is really cool. And Ember is really cool. Like, these are really cool things that have been thought out. But for a little while, there was just JS all over the place. And you got to be like, does anyone know what Kraken.js does? Not a hand goes up. Because none of you work at PayPal? Because it was developed by PayPal. It's a, it's a JavaScript payment gateway. There's no way you'd know that by the fact that it's called Kraken.js. But there's so many more languages out there. And this is the main point of this myth. A lot of people think they need to focus on one thing, become the master of one thing, and make it great. And it's not really about the tools that we use. As developers, we solve problems. So if we're solving problems for our, our clients, our customers, they don't care what, what we're typing into the command line, what text editor we're using. They don't care that you're Vim versus Emacs. They don't care about any of that shit. They care that you've solved their problem. They care that you know, they were able to order you know, 800 Amazon Echoes in 10 minutes for whatever reason. That's what they care about, problem solving. It's not about being with it. It's not about grabbing the coolest new thing and saying, you know, now I'm a Go developer, because that's cool. It's about really focusing on what solves the problem. Um, it's also about evolution. As a person, there's more to you than being a developer. But as a developer, there's more to you than being a specific type of developer. There's more to you than just DevOps, or there's more to you than just being a sysadmin. There's more to you than just being a designer. You have to grow in that space. So let's talk a little bit about my favorite thing, communities. Um, so in a lot of ways, like DevOps Days is kind of a community unto itself, and that's really cool. I really appreciate that about not just DevOps Days Rockies, but all the DevOps Days events. But um, if you look at this diagram, this is like the perfect demonstration of what I'm talking about. So if you want, the, red, the folks in red up in front, that's the Ruby community, and the folks in blue, that's the PHP community, and you have the Java community, and all the other communities. And they're all kind of together, linked by that line that is the technology. But at the same time, they're all separate. And that's a problem. Um, part of that problem comes from the things that people say, their impressions. And I'm going to read these, because these are literally things, and then no attributions. I will not say who said these things. But these are things that people say that are absolutely preposterous to me. Designers aren't developers. They shouldn't be at hardcore tech meetups. I don't know about you. I can code things backwards and forwards. I can make things work. They function. They do what they're supposed to do. And they're in Times New Roman with a white background and black text, because they look like shit. I can't design anything. I can't design anything at all. And then a designer comes along and makes magic, and now everything's beautiful. So to say that designers aren't hardcore or they're not techy enough, preposterous. Um, one of my favorite, sysadmins can live without developers. What do we need them for? OK, that's a very interesting concept. There was a little bit of uh, friction on that. This was someone that I worked with. And I just kind of leaned over and I said, OK, so let's say all the developers go away. Cool. What are you a sysadmin for? What's going on the server? Just going to have a server sitting there that you're monitoring and taking care of? Preposterous. Um, this one, a little bit weird. Business folks don't get developers. Um, business folks that make the effort absolutely do. They should be a part of the tech community. If they're selling tech or they're hiring for tech or they're running a tech company, they have to be involved. And if they're involved, they will, they will understand developers. And in a little way, as a developer, it's our job to help them get there. Um, tech people are socially inept, all of them. Uh, I've been doing this for a while. I, f I consider myself a fairly social person. I may have played a little beer pong with giant oil barrels last night. I think that's a pretty social activity, talk to a bunch of people. So that's just complete and utter bullshit. It's about cross-pollination, learning from other groups. If you don't accept everyone, then you're not going to get everyone's perspective. And if you don't have everyone's perspective, it's just like coding something without ever showing it to a user. It's like building something without ever having someone use it. That means you have no idea how it's going to be used, and you don't really know what's going on. So cross-pollinate. This way, we can make a better tech community. We can make the tech community awesome. So let's talk a little bit about open source and the enterprise. Apple and oranges, right? Um, I did work for a year at IBM as one of their teams as an advocate for open source at IBM. It was an interesting experience. Um, they have a lot more loopholes to jump through, but I learned a lot. Um, we'll go back to this, the idea that one person's code is better than another person's code. Obviously, the guy in the, in the collared shirt and uh, button down is, is an enterprise developer, and the other guy is uh, a Ruby guy. Um, so he works with open source. And of course, all open source people are, are dirty scumbags who live in their parents' basement feeding cats. You know, I think I already covered the whole neck, neck, neck beard issue. 
Um, and of course, all business people are like, ha ha, business. They work in dirty little gray cubicles to build software for other people who work in other little dirty gray cubicles. But that's not the case. There's a lot we can learn here. You know, if we get along and we understand, the open source developer can teach the enterprise developer a little bit about creativity, a little bit about craft, and how having the input to do things allows you to actually move and have some artistry within your code. And the enterprise developer can teach open source developers a little bit about organization and how to have things you know, running in a certain way so that you're better serving the people who are part of your community. So there's something to learn. Um, what else? There's this idea out there, and I know if you've ever been on LinkedIn or any job board or anywhere on the internet ever that involves being hired, um, there's this concept of the Rockstar Wizard Ninja. How many of you are Rockstar Wizard Ninjas? Put your hands down. If you were a rock star, you would be up here, there would be a band playing, someone would be singing, people would be going nuts, it would be amazing, you'd be making a lot more money than you're making right now. If you're a ninja, maybe you are, but you couldn't have raised your hands because I'm not able to see you. And as much as I love Harry Potter, wizards aren't real. Um, probably. So this whole idea that you know we're special because we're developers, or we're special because we're a certain type of developer, or we do some special function within the tech community, it's a myth. It's garbage, and we need to stop feeding that. So when you see the job article, or you get that, I saw your GitHub profile, and I wanted to send you an email. You're a rock star ninja wizard. If you see that, just respond with, no, I'm not. Find some other doofus. The idea is that if we're cool with each other, if we're nice to each other, we can build a better tech community. And that's really what it's about. A better tech community means better code, better applications, better things built for our companies and ourselves. And better people being better to each other. That's really what it's all about. You know, open your arms, give people hugs. Unless they're tactile defensive, then don't give them a hug, you'll get punched in the face. Thank you very much.